Lecture number 12, the 13th century. True Church in the Wilderness. One, where was the Church of Christ during all this anti-Christian development? This theological system that I spelled out in the last lecture didn't develop overnight. As we've noticed, an ingredient appears here and another there, but by the 13th century, it's worked out into a total uh, system that really is uh, so far from a spelling out of sola gratia, a veritable implicit denial of it. So that Christianity is becoming a form of salvation by the church rather than by Jesus Christ. And one asks the inevitable question, where was the Christian church during all this anti-Christian development. Number two, some of it undoubtedly was in the Roman fold, where the elect heard Christ's voice above the cry of false shepherds, as the blind man of the Gospels heard Jesus as the Christ, though excommunicated for so believing. I'm just reminding you by that particular analogy that it is not a new thing for the Church of Christ to become the enemy of Christ. It had happened even in the days of Christ. Remember, he came to his own, and his own received him not. And in John 9, to which I allude here, this blind man who was healed by Jesus and was asked if he believed in the Messiah and said, Who is he? When he heard Christ say, I who speak to you am he. You remember the blind man believed immediately. But he was put out of the church of the time, the synagogue of the day, for believing in the Messiah. We had been predicted for centuries. So now this is a very sad type of development. It is not a new one to find Christ wounded in the house of his own friends. Yet the church persists somehow. And when I asked the question, where was the church of Christ during this deep abasement? First thing I mention is that undoubtedly many of those who belonged to the Roman communion were true Christians. The church had not become totally raise a question about that. How can a church be anything other than apostate when it has a system of doctrine which is other than the scriptural one? Well, my reply is they didn't think it was so. There was no major critique such as I've given here at that particular time. The great Thomas Aquinas couldn't see what was wrong with it. these things you see which become easily visible centuries later that people at the time when it's developing right under their noses as it were can't see uh, happening nearly uh, so clearly as I mentioned Zayberg says sola gratia continued False. It was thought to continue. The church was still claiming it. The church had resisted predestination and rejected irresistible grace, but it was still affirming. That's what Zayberg means by that statement. Sola gratia persisted when these other doctrines had been rejected. But I was saying, by way of theological critique, in distinction from historical, consistently continue with these other elements rejected. And I spell that out and so on. But what I'm trying to say now, and I hope I don't lose any of you in the intricacy of this development, <coughs> my criticism could be quite sound and accurate. And yet at the same time, the people who are phrasing the doctrine this way not see it or intend it. Or if they could ever see that this was the destruction of Sola seeing that they erred in rejecting predestination and irresistible grace. When I say the church was not apostate at that time, what I mean is that they had not explicitly rejected 
what they recognized to be the, uh, what was recognized to be the biblical doctrine. Now we have reason to hope that in spite of the fallaciousness of the salvific scheme, many people could have had true Jesus Christ right in the heart of the Roman communion. I think this was true of people like Francis of Assisi and Lombard and Bonaventura and Aquinas, just to name a few, even though no one would ever be saved truly if he understood and committed himself totally to this kind of salvation. Let me therefore read number two once again in answer to the question, where was the Christian church? Two, some of it undoubtedly was in the Roman fold where the elect heard Christ's voice above the cry of false shepherds, as the blind man of the gospel heard Jesus as the Christ, though excommunicated for so believing. Number three, outside the Roman fold, individual believers survived, and a whole movement grew. And I'll continue with number four before commenting. The wild densities of the 12th and following centuries walked shoeless through the streets of Europe, preaching a simple, primitive form of the New Testament message, and many heard them gladly. Others also were crying out their hallelujahs, though this group was most prominent and most clearly evangelical. The wild densities are an interesting story in themselves. We are limited in this uh, brief course, of course, so we can't go into detail, but the important thing, it seems to me, to remember about the Waldenses is the fact that there were people who may not have been great theologians themselves, as Thomas Aquinas and others were, and so on, but could nevertheless see that what the church was doing was not what the New Testament was saying. And though they were much simpler-minded and less of the shepherd calling them by name. And they also had the courage of their convictions, and as I say, they would march all over Europe, mocked by many and threatened by others, and ultimately, as we'll see, by the Inquisition itself. But at the same time, their witness was heroic, and it was fundamentally to a simple faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't get from the a clear articulation of justification by faith alone. You just get the feeling these are people who know that that is not the way salvation comes, but it is by a direct trust in Jesus Christ. They don't know how to point out the errors of this sophisticated theology, but in their soul they seem to know it is not the way of Christ, just as undoubtedly in the Roman church herself sensed the same thing. Number five, even the organized church at first tried to embrace them, the Waldenses, but the Waldenses marched and later died to a different drummer. Here I can't help but admire uh, Rome. She first of all would try to win people before she would eradicate them. If they couldn't be won and were seemingly opposing the church, they would have to be destroyed if the Roman church with her two swords was able to do so. But she seemed to realize that if you couldn't beat people, you ought to try to join them. If you can do so without in any way jeopardizing your own status and your authority uh, position and so on, and so efforts were made to see if Rome couldn't come to come to terms with Waldenses, and Waldenses couldn't come to terms with Rome. But as I say, the Waldenses were marching to a different drummer, and they couldn't hear the voice of Christ coming through the Roman hierarchy. Number six, the Inquisition was more effective. There it did not, de uh, those whom it did not destroy, it drove into hiding, especially into Alpine fastnesses where many of the Waldenses took their ultimate refuge and because they were in high and hidden mountains, very difficult to approach and were, they were able to elude their pursuers and to survive 
right into the era of the uh, Reformation. But that's the reason many of them were called the church in the wilderness. Taking that figure from the book of Revelation where the woman representing the church attacked by the serpent and dragon were driven into the wilderness and they're protected by her God. I'd like to comment on the matter of the Inquisition. Again, not the details. Of many histories have been written about it. But the fundamental principle behind it. When you find a person like Thomas Aquinas justifying the Inquisition and the torture that went with it, you know there's got to be something to it. I'd not only justify the Inquisition, but I would turn the screws of torture on anyone, any unbeliever, if I thought that could make a believer out of him. And you realize it wouldn't be because of any ruthless inhumanity on my part, but on the contrary, a genuine concern for this person. Here's a person out of Christ. If he continues that way, he's going to go to eternal torment for which there's no relief, no escape ever. Now you know full well if I could save him from that by subjecting him to a two, few days or a few years of torture, if I loved that soul, I would be unrelenting. There's no doubt that there were people who thought that could be done and that that motivated much of the torture that took place in the Inquisition or where it was unsuccessful, it eliminated people who would otherwise threaten the well-being of the church, which in their mind was the same thing as threatening the well-being of Christianity and the human soul and so on. In other words, the way I would put it is, if the Inquisition were able to do what the Inquisition thought it was able to do, it would be a very noble institution. I'm fully aware of the fact that when you use the word torture, especially at the end of the 20th century and so on, you use a word which by just about everybody, including those who administer it, is a horrible term. And battles royal all over the world are trying to eradicate every last trace of torture, which still goes on at an awful pace in many hidden laboratories around the world and so on. It's a bad word, but as I say, if torture were able to save a soul, it would be a very benign term, and every one of you would be obliged to be Torquemadas if you had the opportunity or occasion. But according to the Bible, faith comes by hearing, if it comes at all, and not by tearing. No one is ever brought an inch closer to the kingdom of God by torturing him relentlessly. That's the fallacy of the Inquisition. It was based on an unsound theology. It was working on assumption that it could do good when it had no power to do such a thing. Consequently, it's left as inexcusable form of human torment. There can be no defense for it. Why a man like Thomas Aquinas couldn't see that is explained only because he had an excessive trust in the church and was inclined to think that anything the church decided and the popes approved had to be good. And I said a moment ago he was a Protestant saint. I don't mean that he was free of all the errors that accumulated during the Middle Ages, but that he had a core trust, but that didn't mean he was able to see as Protestantism was later able to see in the 16th century. Number seven, there in these fastnesses, the Waldenses survived to the Reformation and to the greater toleration of modern times. Eight, many interpreters see them as the woman church of the Revelation driven into the wilderness and they are protected by God. It showed from the very beginning a sort of anticipation of the Protestants. And when the Protestant movement did appear, there was almost an instinctive sympathy for it on the part of the Waldenses who had uh, survived and the Protestants themselves saw their forerunners in the Waldenses and there was a sort of happy uh, reunion. As I say, they have 
uh, persisted to the present day. They maintained their own integrity. They didn't tend to join with any of the specific Protestant uh, denominations, but they were sympathetic with it and related to it and a sort of a branch of it. And they continue, as I say, small numbers to the present day. And it looks, as far as I can see, though I've never made any extensive investigation of their contemporary situation, it looks very much as if they've been affected considerably by modern Protestant liberalism as well, which means that the best of churches can decline and very rapidly, though there are, as in the mainline denominations of other groups, a continuing witness in the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. Number nine, others see them as evidence that God will never let the visible church disappear totally from the world. This, I think, is a very important concept. As I said earlier, that scheme of salvation is not the biblical system. It is not the evangelical system. Strictly speaking, no one could be saved by it. Or to put it in another way, if anybody tried to achieve heaven on that basis, he would fail and end in the opposite destination. I mean, that's a very, very serious charge, uh, to be sure. And it would look, since that church was the main church and claiming to be the only church, as if the church had disappeared from the face of the earth. Well, I've been pointing out, no, that isn't the case. There were true Christians within the Roman fold, and that there was the Waldenses movement and other movements as well. And I'm now pointing out to something even more basic than that, and that is that the Bible itself indicates that the true church, a true church, will never perish from the face of the earth. Let me give you one illustration of that from uh, Jeremiah 31, 33. God is speaking, and he says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. In the preceding chapter, that is called an everlasting covenant. Now, what that means is that in the new era of the church, God has promised to keep his people. He kept his people in the Old Testament era, but he never made that promise. But the promise is made for the church in this era that God would preserve it. He'd write his law in our inward parts, his spirit, in our very being. That means, of course, the covenant made with persons like that is everlasting. It can't possibly be broken, which being interpreted means that the church can never cease to be. The professing Christian church can decline and fall in, even into the kind of false salvation patterns such as we have described here, but the true church of Jesus Christ will always be present. And where there are members of the body of Christ, they are going to be associated so that a visible church or a manifestation of true believers is as certain as the divine preservation of those true believers is. This is all by way of saying, in answer to the question, what became of the Christian church in the high Middle Ages? It was there all the time, some of it in an invisible form within the Roman communion, some in visible forms in other communions, but it was there all the time, and we know that it always will be. We're giving these lectures now at the end of the 80s, and there may be a 90s, and there may be a year 2000. How many ever years there may be before our Lord returns again, when he returns, he won't find faith all over the world, but he will find some waiting for him, a true church present when he comes to appear for her. The same thing is intimated in 2 Peter 3, 9, where God says that he is not willing that any should perish, but be brought to repentance. I think I mentioned in our uh, 
a course in handout theology that that doesn't uh, mean that God is not willing that any solitary soul should perish. There are millions of persons who perish, and if God was not willing that they should perish, they would not perish. God can save whom he pleases, he can regenerate as he will, and so on. But what it means is, he is not willing that a solitary soul should perish who is predestinated to be brought to repentance, or who is elect, which means that this world, according to Peter's letter, this world will continue as long as there is one sheep of the great shepherd who has not yet been found. Another way of saying, as I say, that the church of Jesus Christ is going to continue to the end of this age in these last days. There's no guarantee of what's going to happen to her, in my opinion. Post-millenarians think differently on that matter, as you understand, but in my opinion, there is no sure biblical prophecy that the church will be in a robust condition when Jesus Christ comes again, but I think all of us come together on the firm assurance that the church will be, and it will never perish from the face of the earth. Didn't in the 13th century, and it will not in any future century which may yet be. Number 10. All see the Waldenses, along with the Lollards of Wycliffe inspiration, as forerunners of the Reformation. God was preserving a true church, but he was using it as a kind of John the Baptist, in this case, heralding a far greater manifestation of Christ than had yet happened. I'm just, I'm, you understand the movement in my thought here. Biblically speaking, I think we have absolute assurance that the church in some form will exist till Jesus Christ comes again. Now there are episodes in the history of the church, and I think one of them is before us at the moment, which are themselves harbingers of a more glorious era to follow. The Waldenses we're mentioning now, and I'm alluding there to Wycliffe and so on, we'll see still others, which are sort of outbreaks of faith here and there, resisting the general uh, bad development within the main line denomination of the Middle Ages, but these little sparks of truth here and there are almost alerting us to the fact that sooner or later there's going to be a great conflagration someplace. And we do know from the church history which has occurred so far that that is precisely what did happen. Here was Wycliffe, and here was Huss, and here were the Lollards, and here were the Waldenses, and even some of the Albigenses had some elements of faith in them, and here's an individual here and an individual there. The church herself is on a steady downward trek toward apostasy, but not yet arrived. In the meantime, all these tokens of divine mercy all around, it must have made people in the 13th and 14th century believe that these were John the Baptist kinds of harbingers of a greater day to come. I don't know that the Bible teaches that in so many words that that would be or predicts it, but certainly it is what happened in history because we know that the Reformation to which we are approaching was surely the period of the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit since the era of Pentecost, which began church history as we are studying it in this course. So much for the 13th century in some of its details. I want to give a more general overlook in the next lecture that concludes this period.